Hello, and a very warm welcome to today's Vaccine Insights webinar entitled Enabling and Advancing mRNA LMP Medicines from Concept to Clinic. I'm Charlotte Barker, an editor at BioInsights, and joining me today are Lloyd Jeffs, Adam Crow, and Jagbir Singh, who will discuss key insights and experiences that leverage modular microfluidic platform technologies and analytics to enable rapid development, testing, and scale up of mRNA LMP vaccines and therapeutics. So now I'd just like to briefly introduce our presenters. Dr. Lloyd Jeffs joined Precision Nanosystems in June 2018. His biopharma services team is responsible for developing and executing custom, custom programs to meet the clinical manufacturing needs of, nano, of Precision Nanosystems clients. He's a co-author of numerous peer-reviewed publications dealing with the development of lipid nanoparticle therapeutics and is a co-inventor for key patents in the field. Dr. Adam Crow manages a multidisciplinary team at Precision Nanosystems, tasked with developing novel analytical assays related to lipid nanoparticle and nanomaterials for drug delivery. And that team's increasingly leveraged cutting edge technologies such as LCMS to tackle the complexities of LMP characterization. Dr. Jagbir Singh has 15 years of research experience and has completed over 150 projects in formulation development and manufacturing process scale up. At Precision Nanosystems, he leads a team of scientists and staff to develop a diverse range of formulations, including mRNA, pDNA, siRNA, peptides, and small molecules. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jagbir to kick us off with the first presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, um, again, like uh, my name is Jagbir Singh, and I'm Director of Preclinical Services at Precision Nanosystems. Um, and uh, yeah, like... Uh, Again, uh, as mentioned uh, by Charlotte, I lead a team of uh, formulation analytical and bioassay specialists to help our customers in their drug development journey. Uh, Precision Nanosystems uh, was founded in 2010 to address uh, manufacturing challenges in the development of uh, genomic medicines from lab to clinical scale. Currently, uh, we are a leading end-to-end -end nanoparticle solution provider with more than 800 instruments installed worldwide. Uh, we also offer um, off-the-shelf region kits and clinical lipid library to support your drug product development. Uh, in addition, uh, we also provide biopharma services to accelerate our customers' uh, product development from lab to clinic. Um, our my microfluidic uh, nanosember technology has been cited in more than 225 publications and protected by various patent applications. So currently, we are also building a biomanufacturing center in, in Vancouver, Canada, to support your needs for GMP manufacturing. Um, at PNI, uh, we believe genomic medicines are the future. So this was exemplified by the level of response we could achieve by leveraging this technology to develop vaccines against COVID-19. Uh, genomic medicines, um, again, like they, they offer that treatment options for diseases arising from both gain of function mutations or loss of function mutations. So again, we can design uh, payloads construct uh, such as assay RNA to silence a gene. Uh, we can also design mRNA, pDNA to uh, express proteins of interest, uh, in proteins of interest um, in vivo, right? And uh, again, um, ultimately, we can also direct uh, repair, uh, like directly repair the gene mutations using library of gene editing tools. So again, uh, the the opportunities are vast. Uh, it offers a limit less possibilities. Um, so although again, um, as mentioned, genomic medicines, they hold significant potential for future. There exist a number of challenges in the path of transitioning these therapies from lab to clinic and commercialization. So number one, uh, the inherent nature of the nucleic acid itself, they, they, I mean, molecules like RNA, they have lower stability and they're prone to degradation in solution. Uh, in addition, uh, they are polyanine, negatively charged uh, structures. So they, uh, they're hard to uptake into the cells. So again, uh, most often they need a kind of a delivery system for uh, transfection of this uh, nucleic acid into the cells. 
uh, again, there remains a significant knowledge gap uh, because, again, this is an emerging technology uh, and uh, it requires a multidisciplinary approach. So, um, with respect to especially the analytics, uh, which is needed to support formulation development, uh, troubleshooting uh, during the process development. So, there is still a significant knowledge gap uh, which inhibits uh, that transition from lab to uh, clinic. Uh, Genomic medicines, they are complex. They are multi-component drug products where each component needs to come together in a well-defined ratio to ensure safety and efficacy in vivo. So this can make it a very, again, difficult to develop and challenging to scale up. Um, ultimately, like as genomic medicines have potential application in diverse areas, like uh, in treatment of uh, many variety of diseases, so they require different routes of administration, different uh, target issues, um, again, different application areas. And similarly, like here, it again requires that multidisciplinary team with a wide range of capabilities to, to come together to deliver on, uh, on these projects. At PNI, uh, we are helping tackling these problems. First, number one, uh, we are providing our nano sampler microfluidic manufacturing platform for development of these genomic medicines, including the mRNA LNP based vaccines. Um, second, uh, we are also uh, developed uh, and, and developing a library of clinical lipids that can be used by you for encapsulation and delivery of your nucleic acid payloads. So, this lipid library is designed for use in development of both vaccines and gene therapy products. Uh, and finally, and I would say most importantly, we are also addressing the gaps in knowledge, infrastructure, and experience uh, by supporting our customers through their product, uh, uh, drug product development journey using our biopharma services. So in next few slides, uh, I'll be uh, taking a little more uh, deeper dive into biopharma services and how we can help you through your journey. Uh, this slide uh, presents a snapshot of our capabilities and key functional area we support in your drug development journey. So these areas are formulation development, process development, um, analytical development, quality and regulatory support, tech transfer, and manufacturing. So uh, in, in biopharma services, we have an experienced team of about, um, about 70 full-time staff supporting these projects. Uh, among them, at least more than 40 of us has advanced degrees and have been a, a, a lot of experience developing uh, these types of uh, drug formulations. So again, we have experience working, uh, taking these projects from discovery to manufacturing uh, to uh, of the clinical batches. Uh, to date, uh, we have complete more than 160 projects that are in various stages of development. Formulation development services. So here, like, uh, this is like when we are talking about formulation development, um, that can be divided into three stages. First is the early discovery stage, then uh, more like need for a process scale up, intermediate uh, batch sizes, and then ultimately uh, at scale batches in, uh, in clean rooms to su support your phase one, phase two studies. So here, um, again, in the early discovery stage, uh, uh, we can use our GenY kits, our clinical lipid libraries to encapsulate your payload and provide proof of concept formulations in your hand to, to test your science. Uh, we can also develop, uh, like help in development and optimization of your lipid composition and formulation to improve safety, efficacy, and stability. So we can work with our lipids and we can work with your lipids. So ultimately, the aim is to use our microfluidic technology to develop those particles so that we can uh, we can uh, look at the science together. So again, uh, uh, we can also transfer in your formulations and help in process scale up so that uh, formulations can be prepared from milliliter to liters of scale. Uh, and finally, once we have locked formulation, a locked process, we can tech transfer uh, the, the formulation for manufacturing on our GMP system to support your safety talks batches and clinical batches. 
so here analytical development so again uh, it, it analytical development i would say is the key to success in any formulation development project uh, um, again uh, analytical development it helps supports in screening optimization process scale up uh, work by providing that insights into changes in drug product profile um, again we have developed a large area of techniques to understand your formulations better uh, we have methods for physical chemical characterization of particles as well as uh, individual components such as lipids and rna we do routine analysis using particle sizing technique uh, rna encapsulation using a dye exclusion assay based on ribogrin reagent uh, lipid analysis using uhplc with a cad detector elsd high resolution mass spec and other suitable techniques for analysis of lipids RNA and other components. Uh, in addition, we also offer uh, bioburden, sterility, cryo TM, residual solvents, and other analysis needed for product release uh, uh, through our like uh, partnership with third party vendors. So, again, all in all, we can support both analytical method development and QC testing uh, for release of your products. Finally, um, I like to see, say, activity is the king so it is equally important uh, to test the impact of formulation and process conditions on biological activity um, uh, so um, in that uh, way like we can support in vitro screening of formulations uh, during various stages of drug product development to ensure the product retains its activity so we can perform a majority of standard molecular biology techniques such as automated Western blots, uh, automated ELISA, assist, uh, ELISA. Uh, uh, we have flow cytometer, RT-QPCR capabilities. And um, uh, most importantly, again, we have the ability to handle both risk group two materials and cytotoxics in our labs. Uh, we have also uh, a high throughput microscopy uh, techniques uh, that allows us to evaluate a large number of variables such as dose ranges, antibody uh, ratios, cell types, and so on in a relatively short time. Uh, so this allows us to establish correct in vitro models early in the drug development journey. So this uh, slide summarizes the type of projects we have been handling in our labs. Uh, we have experience in working with a variety of payloads. So uh, yeah, including mRNA, self-amplifying RNA, uh, uh, small interfering RNA, micro RNA, circular RNA, um, other types of RNA, uh, uh, PDNA, uh, gene editing payloads. And in addition to developing this uh, lipid nanoparticle formulations, we do have experience developing other types of nanoparticles. Uh, we have projects uh, uh, doing encapsulation of peptides into polymers, uh, encapsulation of uh, peptides into liposomal formulations, or encapsulation against small molecules in um, other systems like liposomes. Uh, in terms of application area, again, um, a, a lot of interest uh, since uh, 2020, I would say, a lot of interest has come in development of vaccines, uh, both uh, prophylactic and uh, therapeutic vaccines. Uh, so we have a lot of experience developing uh, the LNP-based uh, vaccines. Um, uh, more than half of these projects uh, still focus on gene therapy uh, with applications in cardiovascular, lungs, livers, and ophthalmic diseases. Uh, and again, we have also started getting a lot of interest to support uh, cell therapy projects. Um, again, we have experienced, uh, like most of these products are uh, liquid formulations, uh, parental formulations. So we have experienced developing these formulations for administration through variety of routes, including intravenous uh, administrations and intramuscular administration. So uh, in this slide, um, uh, this is uh, actually my attempt to summarize key milestones uh, from transfer in to preparation of first GMP batch for phase one studies. So again, for this timeline, it's uh, the actual timelines uh, is dependent on case-to-case -case basis, the nature of the project. However, for this, this is a typical time frame uh, that for, for a given project. 
here i have taken an assumption that early discovery work has completed um, again as mentioned like uh, pni can um, help and support um, uh, in early discovery work but again for this timeline we are taking that assumption uh, a rna construct um, a couple of uh, like uh, and uh, lipid compositions are selected in vitro in vivo models are selected um, so in terms of timelines, once a program kickoff has happened, it takes two to three months to get to that formulation lock. Again, it takes another two to three months for process lock. And while this point, we are also looking at analytical and biosystem method development also. Um, once we have a locked formulation and locked process, we are ready to uh, transition uh, uh, this formulation to our GMP system for uh, preparation of uh, GLP safety talks and batches. And ultimately the goal is to, uh, to start preparing the master batch records and uh, defining drug product specifications so that we can uh, uh, continue our journey towards manufacturing of those GMP batches and uh, providing those formulation in your hand to start your phase one studies. Again, um, the activities described in blue box are typically the activities handled by precision nanosystems. Some of the activities like sourcing of GMP grade raw materials are, um, are performing those uh, in vivo studies, uh, GLP safety talk studies in, in vivo in, in um, non-human primates and moles and other animals that is uh, handled by our clients. So again, this, uh, this timeline like is, a typical timeline, but this can be shorter, but that is again dependent on the quality and quantity of raw materials. And again, assuming that lead compositions, lead RNA construct and appropriate biological models are already selected. Uh, finally, um, I uh, want to highlight that as a, like Precision Nanosystem is a Denher um, life sciences company. So as part of this uh, ecosystem of uh, Danaher Life Sciences Company, we are in a position to offer a complete end-to-end -end solution under one roof. So we can provide you uh, the uh, needed uh, lipid delivery system. We can support you in, uh, uh, in with your mRNA uh, synthesis needs. And uh, we um, have a full suite of instruments and consumers needed to make your GMP batches for clinic and commercialization. Thank you for listening and uh, happy to answer your question during our Q&A session. And uh, now I would like to hand over the presentation to Dr. Adam Crow to take a deep dive in to the analytics one should, one should consider during nanoparticle development. Thank you. Thank you, Jagbir. I'm Adam Crow. I am the manager of analytical development at Precision Nanosystems. And today I'm going to talk a bit about why you might want to go beyond the critical quality attributes to enable and de-risk your vaccine program at PNI. So one important thing I like to highlight with LNPs is that they are an analytically complex drug product. We think of five major areas of analysis at PNI. This includes the design of your payload the quality of the drug substance going in, things such as its integrity, its structure, the composition of the LMP itself. Of course, this is your lipids, your size, polydispersity. Encapsulation, which amounts to where the RNA is located. Is it on the surface? Is it inside? And all of these parameters come back to the idea of potency which is a central figure. Of course, you can have a beautiful analysis of everything, but if your material is not potent, it loses its ability to be commercialized. Now today I'm gonna to talk a bit about the critical quality attributes or CQAs and why you may wanna go a bit beyond these. So with working with many CDMOs, you will get a standard list of CQAs that they will do for your material. In the bottom right here, I've shown a list of what these generally look like. These are things such as appearance, particle size, RNA content, etc. What's important to note is that although these are really important characteristics, they exemplify the minimum specifications for your drug product release. They don't enable a development of the LMP itself. 
And in fact, you will need a lot more analysis to go from proof of concept to the clinic. To use a rather cliche analogy, we think of this more as the CQAs are the tip of the iceberg. They hide underneath it the ideas about the composition and the design of the LMP, the drug substance and raw material testing, and also a number of assays required to support the development process. In fact, we can count at least 26 different assays that PNI performs to enable the development of LNPs through our commercial services. On the right here, I've indicated a few assays. There are more as well. But as you can see, there is a wide range of assays required to enable a program. So in today's talk, I'm gonna give a bit of background on the standard CQAs and give you an indication of why you want to go a step further with those. So first of which, we're going to start with the lipid quantitation. So shown in the bottom right is a pretty typical UHPLC charged aerosol detection chromatogram, identifying the ionizable lipid on the right, two helper lipids, and the pegylated species. Lipid identification is done to and make sure your product uh, is conform conforms to its specifications, as well as looking at the amount of material there can typically be done by charged aerosol detection, evaporative light scattering, or mass spec approaches. And an important factor you get out of this is your RNA to lipid ratio, or N to P ratios, which determine the quality of your product. However, simply analyzing the lipid concentrations in your final material only gives a very limited story. At PNI, we actually take this a step further and do our routine analysis on each of our individual process steps. The reason we do this is exemplified in the right here, whereas you can see that over the uh, sequential process steps, we see a significant drop in the lipid content in process two. Now, What's important to note here is that although we see a huge drop in the material content, the lipid ratios maintain similar uh, abundances. This is diagnostic for something we usually call aggregation, which in which the material aggregates as a whole and is lost. We can actually change process step two to account for this and actually recover the uh, amount of material and improve the process. So using analytics to find the problem source here and rectify the issue. Another big area of concern is lipid purity. This is a concern because a lot of the ionizable lipids, in fact, the vast majority, are chemically synthesized by third-party vendors. Many of these vendors that we've worked with have older technologies such as evaporative light scattering, which tends to overestimate the purity. Now, given on the right here, I've just given an example why this is. So we have both detectors in house at PNI, and I took an ionizable lipid and spiked in 10% of a known impurity. As you can see by evaporative light scattering, there's less than a percent of relative signal detected, as opposed to charge aerosol, which is almost the stoichiometric amount. This is highly problematic if you are wanting high quality material approaching to the clinic. Now there are other detector choices and each one will be specific to a different type of ionized lipid, but at PNI we find the charge aerosol detection the most diagnostic. The other real concern with lipid purity is the idea of what other species are present. So shown in the top right here is a pure, or what was given as a pure ionizable lipid by uh, a vendor with a CQA or COA stating a 95% purity. Now this was done by ELSD. However, when we take this in house and look by charged aerosol, we see a number of extra species here amounting to over 20% of the total weight. This is of concern for many reasons, 
But even from a formulation perspective, this means that the weight of material you're measuring does not actually account for the total amount of uh, ionizable lipid you're weighing out. So of course, your theoretical N to P ratios don't actually match what is truly there. This has impacts on stability, potency, and many other facets. Taking this a step further, we also like to make sure we identify the individual impurities there. So simply knowing that their impurity is not enough because we need to know what type of impact they have on the formulation. So there are many concerns we have with impurities. There are the obvious ones such as toxicity concerns, but there are the more subtle ones which I think are missed quite a bit. Things like the uh, reactivity with the drug substance and changes in the structure. Uh, relating to reactivity, on the bottom right is some internal data we have, which relates to a phenomenon first described by Meredith Packer in 2021. If you see in blue is an mRNA detected by HPLC-UV. And in the presence of an ionizable lipid, we see a new species forming, which amounts to a covalent adduct that forms between an ionizable lipid impurity and the mRNA itself, which subsequently inactivates the species which has severe concerns on the potency of your final drug product. So because of this at PNI, we make a lot of effort to identify what impurities are present. However, this is a challenging problem. In this example here, which we did with SciX, we took a, a model ionizable lipid called MC3 and found two isobaric impurities, both of which show the incorporation of a oxygen atom. The challenge here is that the location of the incorporation of that oxygen atom in the structure has huge implications on its reactivity. So we needed to determine where this oxygen was incorporating. To do this, we use a new technique called electron activated dissociation, enabled by a high res QTOF instrument from SciX. In doing so, we're able to fragment every single bond inside the molecule. This allows us unparalleled resolution on the structure. So given in the example here, we can cleave each bond until we see a presence of a double bond. So we can see exactly where structural elements like double bonds and other incorporations occur. Using this approach, we were able to fragment both impurity one and impurity two and found that impurity one contains an epoxification at one of the double bonds, which are really quite generally inert from a formulations perspective. However, impurity two showed an anoxide species in which the oxygen has incorporated at the tertiary amine. These are highly problematic as they are implicated in the adduct formation first described by Meredith Packer. And of course, we want to limit these as much as possible as they will inhibit the ability of the LMP to be manufactured. Switching topics, another common CQA is RNA integrity. Now, RNA integrity is paramount because it is the most predictable impact on the potency of your final material. In that if you have 50% loss, of integrity, 50% decrease, you will lose 50% activity. It's quite that simple. Because of this, you want the highest resolution system to detect integrity. So shown on going from left to right is increasing resolution of instrumentation used to look at integrity. And shown is the same mRNA detected through different approaches. As you can see that Simple uh, previous approaches such as ion pairing HPLC or bioanalyzer generally way overestimate the integrity of material. At PNI, we use capillary electrophoresis. And as you can see, there are a number of other species that were not being picked up by the other techniques. Because of this, we, need, we know that this material has lower integrity than estimated. And this allows us to control reproducibility of incoming material. As mentioned, one of the problems with integrity is that it is directly proportional to potency. This is exemplified in the graph in the middle, in red and blue, 
in which we took a drug substance, a self-amplifying RNA in this case, uh, put it under accelerated degradation conditions to degrade it, and looked at the relative integrity by CE versus the expression of EGFP in cells. As you can see, they correlate almost perfectly. In fact, the R value here is almost 0.9. Therefore, if you have a 10% loss in integrity during your formulation, you've lost 10% of your potency, which is highly problematic. Because of this, we spend a lot of efforts to look at the stability of our drug substance prior to starting formulation processes. We do this by putting the drug substance in a number of different conditions and measuring its relative half-life, as shown in the bottom left here. This allows us to screen conditions such as whole, formulation holdup times, buffer selections, material interactions, and storage conditions, and allows us to provide that information to our formulation scientists who can incorporate it into their process development plan, thereby cutting off a number of experiments and de-risking the program. Going even further on RNA that's often overlooked is the ability to ensure conformity of your drug substance itself. Our RNA is a highly complex molecule with many different facets in it. And if we look at the top left, it gives you an idea of all the different types of characteristics that need to be analyzed for reproducible material. Just as an exemplifying one of the facets here we're talking about is this idea of phi prime capping. So it turns out that you can have a perfectly intact mRNA that's only missing one nu methylated nucleotide at the five prime end. And it has, in that case would have zero activity as shown in the right. This is very complex to pick up, but in PNI, we use a approach relating to LCMS to get very careful assessment of the different cap structures of our RNA. This ensures conformity of incoming material and reproducibility of the drug product. Lastly is the area of potency. Now, in my opinion, potency is one of the most underutilized analytical areas in LMP characterization. The reality is, is that you can have beautiful analytics on every other facet, but if your material it does not show reproducible potency, it'll never go towards the clinic. At PNI, we use potency in-house. We have a full bioassay team with full capabilities, and we use it to support the formulation process. We do this by screening every change in process parameters that we undertake in the development. So exemplified here, this is the same LMP composition processed by three different solvent exchange techniques. That's dialysis, centrifugation, and tangential flow. As you can see that using dialysis and then switching to TFF caused a 50 time increase in potency for this material. This allows us to give this feedback to the formulation scientists so that we can choose the best process for individual LMPs and to highlight unseen problems that might not be picked up by CQAs or even other assays. Taking this a step further, we also have the ability to do this in high throughput capabilities. So we can actually measure over 700 samples in a run using automated uh, high throughput microscopy. We can use this to screen things such as lipid selection, lipid ratios, payload designs, processing conditions and storage buffers, and allows us to get solutions way quicker than you may have doing individual experiments. This has allowed us to move many projects forward at a uh, expedited speed. So with that, I just wanted to conclude some key points from this presentation. And I really wanna stress that analytics should not be overlooked when searching for CDMO. They are absolutely paramount to the success of your program. The CQAs are highly important, but they also provide an incomplete picture of what is required for the drug development process. So making sure that there are broad capabilities available is essential when selecting CDMO. And then finally, that the analytics can de-risk your program by identifying problems early on and preventing unnecessary loss in material. And as a final concluding remark, based on 100 plus LMP programs we've been involved with at PNI, 
I really want to give this idea that performing two days of careful analytics can save you weeks of formula de formulation development time. And with that, thank you for being here, and I will pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Lloyd Jeffs. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Jagbir, for very insightful presentations. Um, I'm Lloyd Jeffs. I'm the Senior Director of Biopharma Services here at Precision Nanosystems. I want to talk about our microfluidic manufacturing and how that enables the development of um, genomic medicines, including vaccines. Uh, and I'll give an example of a, a self-amplifying RNA, LMP vaccine that we have developed uh, with the support from the Canadian government. So first off, our microfluidics technology uh, involves time invariant mixing, meaning that we can make formulations less than one milliliter up to hundreds of liters of lipid nanoparticles encapsulating uh, nucleic acid payloads, such as messenger RNA, self-amplifying RNA, and other types of RNA reproducibly and creating a drug product that is highly uniform. We can do that at different flow rates, starting at around 20 mils per minute on our smaller instruments and uh, exceeding actually um, 800 mils per minute currently on our new devices that we're developing, uh, but running typically right now at 200 mils per minute. We can also take these microfluidic mixes and arrange them in parallel to actually scale out manufacturing. And as you see at the bottom of this slide, we are basically controlling the self-assembly of the lipid nanoparticle so that in one step, the nanoparticle is formed where the lipids form around the um, nucleic acid payload through an electrostatic interaction between the ionizable lipid and the nucleic acid, which is negatively charged. Um, there's other mixing technologies, but they're typically harder to control and to scale. And they typically involve unsteady turbulent mixing, as you can see in the bottom left um, of this uh, slide here. So these mixing conditions can constantly change over time uh, and require careful control. Whereas we've solved this for you at Precision Nanosystems with our time invariant mixing and our next gen microfluidics. As Jagbeer mentioned, um, working with our sister operating companies within Danaher Life Sciences, we offer an end-to-end -end synergistic um, solution for developing genomic medicines. So whether it's providing the lipids for making these genomic medicines and the formulations, we can do that. Uh, working internally and with our sister operating company, Aldevron, we can manufacture the plasmid DNA that's required for the in vitro uh, transcription reaction to produce messenger RNA or self-amplifying RNA. Our nanosambler instruments provide this very precise microfluidic mixing that's scalable. Uh, they, they also contain inline dilution for, for reducing uh, the proportion of solvent to stabilize nanoparticles. And we can use our downstream processing technologies from Cytiva and from PAL, uh, such as tangential flow filtration, uh, sterile filtration uh, systems, and uh, robotic uh, uh, isolators for fill finish operations as well. So we can do this, as Jagba said, under one roof, uh, and that allows us to accelerate the development of genomic medicines. So a little bit about our internal uh, self-amplifying LMP program. Uh, we received funding at the end of 2020 from the Canadian government through this Canadian Strategic Innovation Fund to develop cost-effective made in Canada COVID-19 self-amplifying RNA vaccines. Um, we also received a contribution uh, to build a, a genomic medicine manufacturing center, which is proceeding. Uh, with the goal of producing vaccines and other genetic medicines here in, in Vancouver, Canada. So you may ask, why self-amplifying RNA? Well, in short, it has the potential to be 10 to 100 times more potent than messenger RNA vaccines uh, because the self-amplifying RNA encodes non-structural proteins of the alpha virus but are translated into replicases that make more copies of the self-amplifying RNA. And 
because you've got a more potent, potentially a more potent uh, vaccine, we can reduce the doses by up to a factor of 100, thus reducing the manufacturing burden and allow more vaccine doses to be produced in a shorter period of time. At PNI, working um, internally, um, we have actually developed custom vectors uh, that allow us to design plasma DNAs uh, for self-amplifying RNA and for conventional mRNA. So we've also, as Adam has mentioned, developed analytical technologies uh, to study RNA integrity and identity. And uh, we've been able actually to in-house, and this is a picture you see on the right uh, in a local clean room, make tox grade self-amplifying RNA. Uh, so uh, we're quite proud of that achievement and the, the analytics look very good as well. So developing a genomic medicine, an RNA lipid nanoparticle genomic medicine, we're focused on firstly formulation development uh, using the critical quality attributes. Um, again, analytical methodologies are essential uh, in doing formulation development right, as Adam has mentioned. Uh, we do look are looking deeper at the quality of our lipids and the quality of the RNA that we're using. Um, and also the analytics are important for our process development activities, which focuses on the critical process parameters. If you do not have good analytics, you are basically flying blind here. So the better the analytics, the better choices you're gonna be making. Um, also to save time using a quality by design or design of experiments approach is very important in basically having a full understanding of the formulation uh, and the drug product that you are developing. So transitioning from discovery to the preclinical stage, our biopharma services team uh, have done this for many, many projects as Jagpur has mentioned. Uh, these are some of the things that we take a close look at. One is mRNA payload design uh, and the production process by in vitro transcription or IVT. Uh, we look at the analytics or develop suitable analytical methods uh, for the RNA and for the drug product and for the raw materials. Uh, for RNA LMP formation, we're looking again at the composition of the lipid nanoparticle formulation, looking at molar ratios and RNA to lipid ratios or drug to lipid ratios. For particle formation, uh, the microfluidic parameters that we look at are flow rate ratio, total flow rates, and dilution rates. Uh, looking at downstream processing, um, the choice of buffers is important and also is the setup of the tangential flow filtration system, which helps concentrate your drug product and perform buffer exchange. And the choice of sterile filters is also quite important as well. Um, lastly, but not least, um, is basically the need to develop in vitro and in vivo assays to study the performance of your drug. They're important, uh, and they're also important when you're looking at stability as well, because you eventually need to determine a shelf life uh, for your drug product. So starting stability on as soon as possible uh, is very important. It's also important to look at the stability during the manufacturing process, so you can assess if any changes are taking place. So back to our um, self-amplifying RNA LMP, uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID vaccine that we developed. Here you can see as we scaled using our next-gen microfluidics technology and the instruments you see below, uh, we took two formulations that scaled very well uh, on our smaller instrument, the Ignite, uh, to the intermediate process instrument, the Blaze, to our GMP system, where we saw consistently high encapsulation and consistent particle size and polydispersity. Uh, these formulations are uh, made using our proprietary ionizable lipids uh, that we can talk about maybe in the Q&A. Uh, for in vivo testing of self-amplifying LMPs, we used a mouse model with a mon microgram prime, and then after 28 days, a, a boost. And we measured um, 
SARS-CoV-2 specific IgG by ELISA, looked at cytokine measurements, uh, neutralization assays, uh, isolated splenocytes, and uh, looked also at ex vivo re-stimulation of the SARS-CoV-2 peptides, um, and intracellular cytokine staining and cytokine measurements. So we saw for the two formulations of uh, LMP1 and LMP2, um, they both induced uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific IgG response in mice. We also saw that in vitro previously. Uh, also both formulations generated, generated neutralizing antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we also saw effective cellular and humoral immune responses. Um, we have, we did not show that data here in this presentation. Um, moving on to uh, a non-human primate model uh, with the five microgram prime and a five microgram boost at uh, day 56, we saw significant difference in IgG levels uh, at day 42 compared to the pre-bleeds. And we saw a high response um, for all the candidates following the prime, as you can see here. And then after the boost, uh, 14 days after the boost, we saw uh, much higher than the other time points, uh, which is typical for a response after a vaccine boost. So summarizing then the RNA development and technology transfer to GMP manufacturing. So really, we've broken this down into two parts. One is the preclinical and clinical development of the uh, genomic uh, medicine, where here we're seeing, we are sourcing and qualifying vendors for the production of GMP lipids and API. We're optimizing the process parameters to ensure a robust and reproducible RNA LMP manufacturing process at the clinical scale. We're qualifying the analytical methods and the bioanalytical methods uh, for the GMP lipids, our API, and our RNA LMP drug product. Uh, we're also developing specifications as soon as we can. Uh, I think that's often overlooked is the documentation, the SOPs, the specifications that you need to develop a drug. And we typically work uh, with, uh, if we have to outsource, say, our GMP lipid, we typically work very closely with our vendor to ensure that we have appropriate specifications uh, so that we can use these lipid um, raw materials uh, in, uh, in tox studies and ultimately in human clinical trials. So typically at the end of the preclinical clinical development, we uh, produce GLP tox batches of the um, of the genomic medicine and, and release those internally at PNI. So PNI does not currently have GMP manufacturing capabilities. We hope to have that coming online in, in 2024. But uh, so what we need to do then is technology transfer the methods, the processes, our materials and equipment and all the documentation to a contract manufacturer or another GMP facility. So that's the beginning of our technology transfer. That typically takes a number of months and requires a very detailed technology transfer plan that PNI can help with. At the GMP facility or the CMO, uh, we can do the production of engineering batches, which is, I like to call like a dress rehearsal before the GMP batch, and to ensure everything is working, including the analytical methods and also uh, to make GMP batches in the clean room that will be used in the clinical trial. That's not the end of it though, because that starts a QC GMP testing, uh, an extensive review by QA and release, uh, and then packaging and distribution of the finished product. And GMP stability studies and programs will continue for many, many months, uh, typically two to three years, maybe even longer, for both the GMP drug substance, in this case, it would be the self-amplifying RNA, and the GMP drug product, which is the RNA lipid nanoparticle. So we do have a defined set of GMP uh, drug product release tests and core capabilities that you can see in this slide. Uh, and this is some data that we have from a long-term storage stability of our PNI vaccine candidate, 
uh, also showing the morphology of it by priority EM. So for this particular batch, it's been, we've got up to the 18 month time point at minus 80 degrees, which is a, the storage condition for this vaccine, where we're seeing uh, it's stable up to 18 months uh, and similar immune responses in the mouse model that we're using. Uh, and all the LMPs throughout the study had consistent particle uh, size between 70 and 75 nanometers and maintained high encapsulation efficiency. So to wrap up, um, the biopharma services team here at Precision Nanosystems, we've built this over the last few years. Uh, this great team, very proud to be working with our multidisciplinary team of scientists and engineers. Uh, and we have the capabilities to basically help uh, anyone who wants to develop a genomic medicine, whether it's formulation development, process development, uh, help with analytical method development, uh, or quality control or, or quality assurance for that matter as well, and also technology transfer and manufacturing. So thank you very much for your time. I'd like to acknowledge again, the Government of Canada for support for our self-amplifying RNA LMP program. Uh, collaborators, Dr. Rodden Shaddock and Dr. Von Perry and Dr. Matt Stone of the team at SciEx for help with the analytics. And special thanks to Brent Sutherland and the team at the Investigational Drug Program at the BC Cancer Agency. And basically every department at PNI helped uh, help us get to where we are today. So there's uh, over 200 of us at PNI, and I think everyone has played a role in basically helping us develop the state-of-the-art biopharma services. So I'd like to thank my colleagues at PNI as well. So again, thank you for listening, and I think we'd be happy to take some questions.